Okay. Hey, it's good to be um, it's good to be back here for our second show, the uh, Jack Star Guitar Hour, and uh, we're going to do more of the same, more guitar playing, uh, covering different uh, genres of music, and also I am going to play a little bit more a cappella today. What I mean by that is a little less with backing tracks and a little bit more of just a guy playing his guitar with a bunch of video cameras through the internet. So like, uh, I'm going to start off by doing a, a lick, blues lick, blues riff that I came up with. It goes like this. playing that one it's a little I'm gonna do it a little lower volume and I'm gonna do it so you guys can check it out how I did it what I like um, I just kind of like the swampy quality of that riff what I mean by that is like some riffs just like kind of make you feel like uh, you're in a swamp in Louisiana somewhere. Here's another swampy riff. I got to do it real low volume. open E riffs so you can start you can actually finger pick it like this to show off with, uh, you know, I mean, blues came from a much more mellow, uh, folky sound, and, and then it evolved into the Chicago sound. But what really happened was when the Southern blacks migrated to Chicago in the uh, 40s, uh, two things happened. They, they changed their lifestyle. They were no longer, you know, working in the fields and doing field holler kind of, you know, blues songs. And, but more importantly, the electric guitar got invented. And when that happened, the guitar became more of a solo instrument. So you didn't have to play like a million chords. You know, you didn't have to accompany yourself. What you, what you could do is you could have a band behind you and then you could do uh, single note leads. And um, I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about. We're going to do uh, this song. It's called uh, Someday After a While. It's on our uh, Greatest Hits blues album. 
And it goes something like this. It's in the key of F. And it's got a lot of accompaniment, so I, don't, I only need to play single note solos. Let's hear it. That was, uh, that was a blues in uh, F. Uh, I did something interesting as I started playing in relative minor and then I switched to pentatonics. Now, I don't want to devote the whole show to explaining it, but it's something that if you're musically inclined and you have more than a passing interest in guitar, you should find out because um, it's really good to integrate both when you're doing a solo. Uh, the relative minors tend to have a more melodic quality. The pentatonics tend to be more bluesy. So some guys make a whole career of just playing relative minors, and some people never play them. B.B. King, for instance, hardly ever plays relative minors. He just plays straight-ahead pentatonics. Uh, there was a guy named Leslie West uh, who had a band called Mountain, and basically all he did was play relative minors. So you have both sides of the spectrum. And, and I like to do both. So that's the story with that. Now, I mentioned B.B. King, who is undoubtedly the greatest blues guitar player alive. And uh, I'm going to do uh, a song that is his signature song. It's called The Thrill Is Gone. And I am going to start off doing pentatonics in the key of B minor. And then at one point, I'm going to go like that as I'm playing, and I'm going to switch into relative minors. And see if you can hear the, the tonal difference when I do that, when I switch into the relative minors. 
And uh, if you can, then get like a really good guitar teacher around here, maybe uh, some that I won't, re I'm, I'm not plugging anyone, but there are some very good guitar teachers out here. And then they can explain to you what the whole deal with that is. But you'll hear it. So we'll start off by having you hear it. And uh, we're going to do The Thrill is Gone, but it's never gone when you watch the Guitar Hour show. I had to say that. Got to be corny once in a while. Okay. <laughs> Here it goes.
Yeah, at one point, I, I, um, I actually, the way I play is I usually use relative minors and also uh, pentatonics and actually just straight out minors also. But what I did in this is when I did go to the relative minor, I went like that. So hopefully some of you guys caught it and you heard the, the difference. Um, but anyway, it's all, it's all good. And I think um, some guitar players like myself, we blend a lot of styles as opposed to like just playing in one style, you know. Like I've heard guys, uh, uh, especially, you know, especially down here in the South, that do a lot of like country style playing where they do a lot of those kind of scales. Or they'll just stri stay strictly into pentatonics. Whereas I kind of get a little more eclectic, and that's a nice word, but uh, it just means I just blend a lot of different styles. And uh, I hope you guys like that. And continuing the theme of minor or major, the next song that we're going to do is a song that's in C major. Okay, so this is C major right here. This is your C chord. But you can also play in A minor if you're doing the relative minor mode. So, so this song is going to be another example of major or minor, and you can use both. And uh, I'm going to start this one off by playing in relative minor. I call this minor major or a minor disturbance. Goes like this. In track with just a one bar count in. One bar, that's all we need. Okay, so I actually ended up uh, playing mainly in relative minors. I only broke into pentatonics like twice, really, in that whole uh, song. Reason being is um, it's like a judgment call when you hear a certain amount of music and you're a guitar player and you're uh, you know, required to do a solo over it. Um, if you feel it, like I just felt it needed relative minors. I felt it was a melodic piece of music and I didn't want to just play the pentatonic uh, blues scale. So 
I chose to do the relative minor. That whole song could have been done in, um, in pentatonics. In fact, what I want to do is a little experiment right now. We're going to go back. I'm going to do the first minute of that song and not do any relative minors whatsoever. And we'll see what it sounds like. We'll see if, if I'm just a typical blues guitar player that really doesn't know anything about relative minors, how I would approach it. So we're going to go back and do the first minute of that. And then when our sound engineer decides he's had enough of hearing the pentatonics, he'll just shut it down. <laughs> so we'll do about a minute of it. Okay? Here goes. Same song. Here's the backing track with just a one bar counting. So, what I did is I just played the, the same song, totally in pentatonics, and uh, did you guys uh, in our huge studio audience, did you hear the difference? I did. did? Yeah. Everybody heard it? Okay. So now what we've done is we've really uh, talked about an important thing in guitar playing. Should I be a minor, a relative minor kind of player, or should I be a pentatonic player, or should I be both? Should I be a Republican or a Democrat, or do both of them have valid ideas at some point? Who knows? But anyway, that was that. Now, do you want to get a break? we are going to take a nice little break so we can um, highlight our sponsors who are doing a wonderful job of keeping this show uh, fiscally independent and happening. And then we're going to come back and do more guitaring. Stay tuned, guys.
We are back. We are back. I hope you guys enjoyed a vintage uh, clip from uh, 1988. You know, I was only like five years old back then, of course. And uh, that clip was from a club called Sundance in Long Island, which was owned by my manager at the time, Frank Cariola, who was a great guy and a, uh, just a great manager and club owner and a, kind of like a Long Island uh, celebrity in his own right. But anyway, getting back to the guitar stuff, I'm going to play a little guitar a cappella, which means no backing tracks, no bands, no help whatsoever, just, just guitar. And uh, I like to do this little thing in the key of C. It goes like this. <laughs>
is a little thing that I like to do, and it kind of has like kind of like a ZZ top quality if you play it a little bit faster, like this. <laughs> to just play a cappella sometimes so that you guys can hear you know we live in a world where everything is edited cut and pasted and there's a lot of studio trickery that goes on when you hear uh, music on the radio or you see it there's something called auto-tuning which helps singers there's uh, multi-tracking which helps guitar players there's uh, cutting and pasting even the drum beats aren't even uh, played uh, you know, at a time, they're cut and pasted. So it's really good. Um, this show that we're doing is really live. And um, I'm really live. There's no trickery. There's no nothing. If I hit a wrong note, that's because I'm only human. I try not to hit wrong notes. But so what I'm basically saying is that we need more of uh, just people just playing and uh, I think that it, it has more humanity and it's more, uh, it's just more real. And when I uh, pick up the guitar, I never know what I'm going to play. Like here's a little riff that I wrote, it's a little kind of a blues thing. <laughs> You never know what's going to come out. And um, I had a friend back uh, in New York. I would, you know, I kind of looked up to him. He was a really great guitar player. And I would say, well, what do you do to practice? Do you do scales? I mean, do you do, you know. And he said, he said no. He goes, I, I jam with myself. And I looked at him and said, what does that mean, I jam? He goes, well, I pick up a guitar and I see what comes out. And I was just like, look at him. Wow, I want to do that course this was like a long time ago and he was like 10 years older than me and he could do that he could just pick up a guitar and what would come out would come out and it was usually pretty pretty darn good and basically that's what I do at this point in my life I uh, I jam with myself so I'm going to do a little jamming with myself live in front of the whole world I'm going to do this in the key of E <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah. I was just a little, a little jamming, um, and you know, it's a cool thing to do. It's also a really good warm up, you know, to just uh, start playing. Uh, I saw, uh, well, I listened to this uh, album one time, Mick Taylor, and uh, he was the guitar player in the Rolling Stones, and he played in John Mayer. And what he was doing is he was just banging on the floor. It was like a wooden floor, and that was the drums. So he was like doing, a, like kind of like a rhythm bike. <laughs> This next one, we're going to do another uh, song right now. We're going to do track four, a really famous blues tune called Rock Me Baby. There's a million versions of that. Uh, for people that are into YouTube, check out uh, Jeff Beck's version. Check out Robin Trower's version. Check out the version, of course, by B.B. King. And I've got a version that I did uh, on YouTube with Sylvester Stallone's brother, Frank Stallone, and we're doing it at a, uh, a place in Sebastian. It's called Sebastian Beach Inn, and you'll hear me doing Rock Me Baby, and you'll hear Frank Stallone singing it. So that's a cool YouTube thing for you guys to check out. But anyway, here is Rock Me Baby, key of B, as in boy. Goes like this. And it is track four on our greatest hits. <laughs>
Yeah. So that's Rock Me Baby. Now, um, that particular song, I don't believe can be played in relative minors. And I've never tried to play it in relative minors. But just for the heck of it, should I try it? Yeah. yeah. All right. So this might be kind of weird. It's, it, you know, this is a, a live experiment. I've never, ever attempted to do this. So the relative minor of D is a, wow, it's a key that I really hate. No, nah, I'm not even going to do it. I just, it's, it's going to sound too weird. Okay, you guys can do it at home, though, if you want. Try playing Rock Me Baby, key of B, in the relative minor. Okay, the next song that we're going to do, we're not going to do, because we did it last week. And this song's been, Crossroads has been already beaten, beaten to hell by every band in the world for the last, like, 40 years. We're going to take a, a breather from Crossroads. We're going to move to track number six which is a song called Help Me. It's a blues tune. It was done by 10 Years After, and it was done by a lot of people, including there's a, a guy out there now named Joe Bonamassa who's getting real popular, and he does that song live, too. And uh, It's just a cool song. It's in the key of G, and it's called Help Me. It's in our greatest hits, number six. It goes like this.
That's another song that I don't think can really be played in relative minors, and it might sound weird if I even attempted it. So that was strictly, you know, mainly just pentatonics and, and just minors, but not relative minors, because there's a big difference between minors and relative minors. And that would also take a couple of hours to explain that. So that's what guitar teachers are for. I'm not really a guitar teacher. Uh, I play one on TV, but no, that was a bad joke. Um, but there are guys in this town where we live in central Florida that could show you a lot about the technical reasons why I do what I do. And uh, I'll tell you a real funny antidote. I don't really know a tremendous amount of technique, even though I play using a lot of technique. Uh, I met this guy once. He was a musical director for the Tanglewood Symphony Orchestra in New Jersey. Really famous orchestra. And I was sitting down. There was a bunch of people, and I'm playing guitar. And, and he said something to me like, that was really very inventive use of the uh, Mixolydian scale and the e-harmonic minor scale was great and I loved what you did with the uh, diminished and the and that, this was about 20 years ago and I just looked at him honestly and I said I have no idea what you're talking about but I will take that as a compliment so that's kind of the way I evolved is I strictly was kind of like the monkey at the typewriter I've been doing it so long that I figured it all out I figured out every scale and I don't even use scales actually when I play guitar this, this is the deal right here. Every note in every key can be used. So, let's say there's 144 notes on the guitar. Let's say it's 6 times 12, whatever that is. Or, uh, well, well, hold on, hold on. There are, let's see, let's count it off. There's 22 frets, so it's 6 times 22. What is 6 times 22? I believe it's 100 and... Uh, 144. All right, yeah. So, basically, every note on the guitar can be used in every key. You just have to figure out how to place them. Now, some notes seem like they would be out of key, but if you play the right note before it or after it, or if you bend that note, it will be right. So, that is the secret, but... It sometimes can take about 40 years to learn how to do that correctly. Or you can study with a guitar teacher and hope that that knowledge will, will come. We don't know. But some of the good guitar teachers out here, just go to Guitar Haven. That's uh, a uh, place in Melbourne. And you've got guys like uh, Rick Finke, who's very good. You've got uh, Chuck Van Riper. You've got Howie, I don't know if Howie, Howie teaches, Howie Katz. You've got uh, Paul Chapman, who's another really good teacher. Yeah, so there's a lot of great guys out there that can explain all that to you. But, I mean, just to give you, uh, just to give you an idea, like, like, take the note F. When you're in A, a lot of times you might not think that F could be used, but if you listen to the end of Stairway to Heaven, when he's going... Uh, See that F right there? It sounds fine. So every note really can be used. You just have to know how to put it in the right context. But I really do believe that every note can be used in every key. You just have to know how to do it. And um, I did it by learning uh, hit and miss. It was just kind of like, after doing it for a really long time, I started realizing, well, that note doesn't work. This note doesn't work. This note does work. But that note will work if I play this note in front of it or this note behind it. And then after a while, you don't even think about it anymore. You just kind of close your eyes and you play. And that's when you've reached uh, the guitar playing that you would like to do when you first start out. You know, when you first start off and you see these guys and you're wondering, well, why is it just flowing out of them? It's just because they've been doing it a real long time. And real long time doesn't mean how many years either. It means how much time. You could be like, 22 years old, but if you're playing 10 hours a day and you're doing it for like a couple of years, you've already equaled the time output of somebody that's 35 
that's only doing it an hour a day or someone that's like 50 and only doing it a couple of hours a week. So it's really a question of, well, how much time are you willing, you know, how much sacrifice time are you willing to do this? Um, I mean, when I was a kid, a lot of my friends used to like call me up sometimes on weekends. Hey, man, let's go out and party. Let's go out and drink. Let's go out and have some beers and, and chase women and do what a normal 19-year-old is supposed to do. But most of the time, I'd say, no, no, I'm going to hang out and practice guitar. And they look at me like, wow, you really want to do that? And it was, yeah, I was enjoying myself, and I was getting better. And, um, and of course, the other stuff, uh, the beer drinking and women chasing, that all comes later on anyway. <laughs> the, better, the better at guitar you get, the more of that insanity seems to follow you. And then you realize after a while, well, you don't really need that either. It's better to just be sober and monogamous and all those wonderful good things. Because we are trying to teach you not only guitar playing here on the show, we're trying to teach you how to live your life right. Okay? You got that? And on that note, I'm just going to do a very cool riff. Yeah, I just have to throw that in there. Uh, so... So anyway, the next song we're going to do is by one of my top favorite guitar players of the whole world, a guy named Carlos Santana. This one is called Black Magic Women. Um, Carlos is great. Sometimes he says wacky things in interviews, but hey, we all do. Uh, if you read some of my European interviews, I said some things that I'm thoroughly ashamed of for having said. But uh, I'm not going to tell you what they are. And if you don't speak German or if you don't speak French, great. Then you'll never <laughs> read them. <laughs> but the thing that I like that Carlos said in Rolling Stone magazine about two years ago, and I'm still trying to figure out exactly what Carlos meant by that, but he said, when I play women's, part of their anatomy gets hard. So Carlos... God bless you, man, because <laughs> I want to be able to do that, too. So we're going to play, we're going to play Black Magic Woman by uh, Peter Green and Carlos Santana. It's track number seven on our greatest hits album. And if some women out there get turned on when they hear this, that's even better. But if not, <laughs> it's still good music. It goes like this.
Carlos Santana. Um, the thing about that song is that you can play that song as a blues song, which it really is a blues song. Uh, it comes from like this long line of blues songs. Uh, one of them is called Who's Been Talking, you know, which is very similar. It's a minor blues. The other one, uh, also by Peter Green, is uh, I Loved a Woman. And um, Thrill is Gone is another example of that. So you don't have to actually play a whole lot of minors uh, like Santana did. What I want to do is replay that song, but um, it's, um, it's track number seven. And I'm going to see if we can make that song sound more bluesy and less like Santana. Just for the heck of it, we're going to see what the guy that really wrote the song, what he was really thinking of. He had no idea that there was a Hispanic guy from L.A. Who, whose family moved from Mexico City, came to L.A. that was going to cover his song a few years later and just own that song. He had no idea. He just wrote this minor blues song. He had a band called Fleetwood Mac. And uh, this is what... It might have sounded like with Peter Green playing it. So I'm going to try to obliterate the Santana references to that song, if I can. cheated. I did hit one minor note in there. And I caught myself doing it right at the very last 10 seconds of that. I caught myself doing it. I said, damn, I, I couldn't stop myself. The Santana version is just so, uh, it's just so in, what's the word uh, I'm looking for? It's like impregnated in our minds that, that we can't, I can't, it's hard to just do it as a blues song anymore. It's kind of like you know, Bob Dylan wrote a song called Along the Watchtower, but really, even, even Bob Dylan had to say that the song is Jimi Hendrix's, you know, because you cannot think of Along the Watchtower anymore without thinking of Jimi's incredible version of that song. So, um, but that was like a little, a little experiment to see, uh, you know, where it would take us. Uh, this next song uh, I really like because, you know, we were talking about the Three Kings on last week's show. There's uh, three guys, all with the last name of King. I don't know why, but Albert King, Freddie King, B.B. King. And uh, they're all phenomenal guitar players. I uh, personally like Freddie the best. Uh, but it's a, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a personal thing, you know. Uh, like Stevie Ray Vaughan was a big fan of Albert King. Clapton was obviously a big fan of Freddie King. And also a big fan of B.B. King. And I actually like all three of them. I think they're all incredibly talented. And we're going to do a Freddie King song called The Stumble. It's an instrumental. It's track eight on our greatest hits. And uh, it was just a really great, 
follow-up to Hideaway, which a lot of people remember that one. But anyway, this one's called The Stumble, and it's in the key of E. It goes like this. <laughs> Stumble. Great, great song. We're going to take a break right now. Uh, I'm going to get a chance to drink some uh, Dunkin' Donuts iced coffee because uh, I'm not drinking Arizona iced tea today. So we'll be back in a few minutes.
All right. Um, we, uh, we checked out some more heavy metal uh, from my band Burning Star. Uh, anyway, we were talking about Carlos and his incredible ability to connect with women when he plays guitar, and I always thought that that's pretty amazing. Okay, so on our little sonic experiment, we're going to play Black Magic Women again, and now I'm going to try to really zero in on the sensuality that's inherent in that song. So we're going to do Black Magic Women one more time, and it goes like this. the show uh, today. Thanks for watching, and Carlos, if you get to check this out, I love you playing, brother, and I hope to meet you one day, and uh, we'll jam. <laughs> All right, so peace out. Have a great day, everybody, and keep watching the show, because it will get interesting, more interesting. <laughs> <laughs>